All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Darby Creek Church. Thanks for coming and connecting. It's busy gabbing out there, and I almost missed my cue here. But we're ready to go, so we appreciate you, and we're going to just turn to worship here this morning. I want to open up with a verse, a couple verses from Psalm 30. It says this, you have, turned my, for, you have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have loosed my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness, that my glory may sing your praise and not be silent. O Lord my God, I will give you thanks to you forever. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer as we continue on. Lord God, we just thank you so much for this morning, this beautiful day. Thank you, God, that you call us to come to you because you love us. Lord, and we do recognize, God, that uh, this life is hard. God, we suffer losses. We suffer hardships. Sometimes there's long seasons of grieving, God, but uh, we trust in you that you bring joy. You bring an end to those seasons and ultimately will be the ultimate season of joy with you when we're with you in your kingdom. So we just look forward to our future with you. Thank you for the way that you heal us up and help us to praise you right now. In Jesus' name. All right, if you're comfortable standing, let's stand on up and we're going to sleep. Search the world, but it couldn't fill me. Lines up to praise, the treasures that fade are never enough. Then you came along and put me back together. Every desire is not satisfied here in your love. Hey, oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Amen. Oh, 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 oh. I'm not free to show you my weakness, my failures and flaws. Lord, you've seen them all, and you still call me friend. Cause the God of the mountain. Is the God of the valley, and there's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. Oh, there's nothing, sing it out, better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. Oh, there's is better than you. You turn morning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn grace into God. Turn bones into honey. You turn seas into highway. You're the only one who can. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. You turn graves into gardens. 
He's a miracle working God. Amen. All right, this is John 11. It says, Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your, bro your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Man, he's our living hope. Let's sing to him. Silence, the roaring lion. 
is our living hope. All right, why don't you have a seat? Pastor? Hey, let's, let's go to prayer one more time here before we get into God's Word this morning. Uh, Lord Jesus, we just thank you so much for uh, this opportunity to come together, to, to, uh, to worship, to sing songs, uh, praises uh, to your name. And, and um, Lord, now we want to we look at your word. We want to um, know what your will is and get to know you better uh, through your word. And thank you, God, that we don't have to wonder um, uh, in, in some sense, what your will is. You, you've, you've plainly spoken in the scriptures, and so now we're just looking at what you have said, and uh, we're asking uh, for you to um, work uh, in our hearts. Lord, help us to, to see clearly what uh, it is you have for us this morning. Lord, give us uh, sensitive hearts and minds toward what you want us to do as a result of this, or what you want us to believe. And Lord, I, we also want to take this time to lift up uh, people that we know that are struggling right now physically. They're, they're battling uh, illnesses and uh, not feeling well. God, we just pray that your Holy Spirit would um, touch them, heal their bodies. Um, those that are struggling maybe with mental illness, Lord, we just pray for your healing touch, your, um, give them endurance and pray that they would look to you, Lord, and uh, for uh, sustaining them and through maybe a, a difficult time right now. And, and uh, Lord, we just uh, also just pray for those of us that might be really struggling in our walk with you spiritually and that you would um, help us to uh, endure the trials that we might be in, um, to uh, be victorious over things that we're struggling with, um, to walk in victory there. And God, we just uh, we we pray these things in the name of Jesus, Amen. All right. So um, last week I told you when I, I first started the message, I knew there was no way we were going to get through that. This was going to be a two parter. Uh, I titled it "Jesus Reigns Over the Natural and the in the Supernatural World." And last week was basically about Jesus calming the storm. Jesus calming the storm, and and this week. We'll look at the verses uh, in Luke chapter 8, and that's what we're doing as a church. We're just making our way through the book of Luke. Um, when we get to the end of chapter 9, we'll be, be taking a little break and doing uh, a topical series, and then we'll be jumping back into Luke again. So, But uh, that's what we usually do. We're going through books of the Bible together here as a church. And so, um, and one of the habits that we have uh, a lot of times is in honor of uh, the Word of God, and in a symbolic way to show that we're putting ourselves under the Word of God, uh, would you, if you're able to, stand with me as I read God's Word this morning? And so uh, it's Luke 8, uh, chapter, Luke chapter 8, verses 26 to 39. I'll just read this, and it'll be here on the screen for it to, to watch and listen. Then they sailed to the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. And when Jesus had stepped out on land, there met him a man from the city who had demons. For a long time he had worn no clothes and had not lived in a house but among the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him and said with a loud voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many a time it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles, but, the, but he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the desert. Jesus then asked him, What is your name? And he said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. And they begged him not to command them to depart into the abyss. Now a large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him to let them enter these. So he gave them uh, permission. And then the demons came out of the man and entered the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and drowned. And when the herdsmen saw what had happened, they fled and told it in the city and in the country. Then people went out to see what had happened, and they came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had gone sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who had seen it told them how the demon-possessed man had been healed. Then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked him to depart from them, for they were seized with great fear. 
So he got into the boat and returned. The man from the demons had gone, begged that he might be with him, but Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. And he went away, proclaiming throughout the whole city how much Jesus had done for him. This is the word of the Lord. Please have a seat. Quite a dramatic encounter, isn't it? Quite a dramatic encounter. This man is, uh, has, had, has many demons. He's demon-possessed. And uh, what we want to take a look at first here is just, I mean, the plain fact is that G- the power of Jesus changes lives. There's no question this man's life was totally transformed. Um, now, I'm not saying that we're all demon-possessed here, but demon possession is a real thing, um, and, and that does happen and can happen. Um, but what I want to just kind of focus in on here is the fact that Jesus Christ transforms people's lives. I mean, you look at the before and the after of this man, right? Uh, Jesus steps off the boat uh, to the other side of the lake. Remember, they had just come through the storm, and Jesus just spoke a word, and the storm was calm, and the sea was calm. And as soon as he steps on to the land, uh, we see uh, he's it says he's met there. Met him a man from the city who had demons. Uh, so he, for a long time he wore no clothes. So he's out there naked, living in the tombs. All right, and so. Um, uh, and you, can, you get the sense that this man is not in his right mind. And the cause of it is demonic. Okay, this is, I think this is important to realize that not every mental problem is demonic. Okay? But this one was. This one was. Uh, it's clearly told to us in Scripture. And so, um, but, but here we have this man who is who's not in his right mind because of demonic possession. And um, the fact is that, um, you know, we are all in a spiritual state initially, and I mentioned this some in communion, where uh, we need a transformation. Uh, Our spiritual state before coming to Christ uh, might not be demonically possessed, but we are being influenced by the demonic world, okay? I think it's important for us to realize that. Now, um, um, some people don't even believe in a spiritual realm. They don't even believe in uh, the demonic realm, demons and angels. And, and you know, it, um, that's exactly what Satan would love to happen, right? Because if the, the best thing you could do is get somebody, you know, especially if something is as, as subversive, if, as you will, as demonic attack in, in, in the spiritual realm, is if you could get people to not believe that it actually exists, right? And so, but it is real. And I want to read to you um, some scriptures that just kind of uh, point to the fact that um, the, of our spiritual state, of anyone's spiritual state um, before coming to Christ here. So in Colossians uh, chapter 1, verses 13 to 14, listen to what it has to say. It says, He has delivered us. Uh, So this is Jesus. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Now, you know, we just just took communion together. We just talked about how, you know, how how are our sins forgiven? It's by putting our faith in Jesus, right? And, uh, And because of what he did there. And, and uh, so we can be forgiven and that we could be redeemed, like this last verse says, in whom? It's in Jesus. It's in Him we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. But did you see what the previous verse said? It tells us that, you're, that everybody in the world is either in one domain or another, living in one kingdom or another, uh, spiritually speaking. And that is, everyone is either in the domain of darkness or in the kingdom of the beloved Son, Jesus. You're either in the domain of Satan or you're in the kingdom of 
Jesus. There's no in-between um, in terms of our spiritual status, okay? Um, now, that's kind of shocking, right? When I, when I first read that as a new believer, I'm like, I feel like that's shocking because I felt like I really, I felt like, again, the key word felt like, uh, I felt like I wasn't really against God or on Satan's side, but the problem is this was, was in my heart, though, I was living in rebellion to God. I was doing things I knew he wouldn't approve of. I wasn't at all interested in the things of God or how, what he even thought about me. And so, so uh, if you're in rebellion to God in your heart, uh, that is uh, just as much as saying you're in the domain of darkness, right? You're, if you're not living for God, you're living for Satan, um, whether you want to admit it or not. Okay, and so, so I'm, I'm just mentioning this Colossians passage because it really does explicitly say that um, before encountering the transformational power of Jesus, everyone is in the domain of darkness. Okay? And um, if you look in uh, the book of Acts, in, in chapter 26, verses 16 to 18, uh, here it says, it says, but rise and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant. Now, you got to realize uh, we're, we're dropping in here on a passage, right? So, the Apostle Paul had a dramatic conversion story, okay? Literally knocked off his high horse on, right, on the road to, to Damascus. So, he's, he's not, he, he has a personal encounter with uh, the resurrected Christ, right? And, and now uh, Jesus is speaking to him and telling him that uh, his life is going to change, right? Because prior to this, Paul, uh, or Saul, known as Saul at that time then, was a persecutor of the church. Round up the Christians, lock them up, behead them, whatever. I mean, you name it, he was involved in it. Okay? But he thought he was doing the will of God. He thought he was doing the will of God. Right? So, here's, here's what it says. Uh, the Lord says, But rise and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and witness to the things in which you have seen me and to those in which I will appear to you, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. He's like, Paul, I'm sending you on a mission, and when you preach the gospel, what's going to happen is some people's eyes will be opened. And they'll realize their hearts are in rebellion to me and that they need free. They need to be freed from their sin and from whatever is enslaving them. And he mentions again, right? He says, so that they may turn from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God. You can't get any more, uh, you know, opposites, right? He's just laying that out, uh, just like we saw in Colossians. That they may receive forgiveness of sins, and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. And so you just get the idea. Until you receive forgiveness of sins through Jesus Christ, you are in the domain of darkness. You're spiritually blind. And God has to open your eyes. Okay? And, uh, and I would dare say that anyone who has a relationship with God through Jesus Christ could tell you, that yes, there was a, a time when I, I didn't understand that I was, uh, you know, far from God, you know. Uh, they weren't even really thinking about God, but, but that their life has changed. And that's what we're talking about. The power of Jesus changes lives. And the fact is, He is the only one. Jesus is the only one who can transfer us into God's kingdom, right? He's the only one. Um, that can do that. Now, in, uh, in the book of uh, 
Romans here. It mentions in verse 6. It says, but now you are free from the power of sin. This is, he's talking to believers here. Now, now you are free from the power of sin and have become slaves of God. Now you, now you do those things that lead to holiness and result in eternal life. Do you see in that just one verse, there's, there's a transformation that occurs, right? Uh, in that uh, before coming to Christ, right, we were enslaved to sin. The book of Romans lays that out pretty clearly. And, 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 and you come away with the idea that in terms of our spiritual status, we're, we're going to serve somebody. We're either serving sin or we're serving the Lord, okay? It's, it's one or the other. There's no in-between there. And, and he said, but he does say, if we put our faith in Christ, we'll be free from the power of sin. And I don't know. I mean, there, I mean, there are some people, when you talk to them before they came to Christ, they were entrenched in all kinds of things, right? Um, and, and, you know, some people may, you know, it doesn't really matter what kind of sin. Some may say, you know, some sins are more, quote, spectacular than others or worse than others. Um, but it's all sin, and we all need to be saved from it. And so, uh, but the idea here is that, you know, the only way that someone's going to experience life transformation and be free from the power of sin is you have to know Jesus. That's it. That's the only way. Uh, that is literally the only way. You, you know, there's, there's um, uh, no amount of, of your own work on yourself alone is going to bring about freedom from the power of sin. Okay? It's not going to happen. We have to have a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And maybe that's uh, a first for you hearing that about the idea of a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And that's, that's what happens when we put our faith in Christ. We are actually then in right standing with God, and we actually have a relationship with Him. We can talk to Him. He, he hears us. We you know, just like the old hymn, he walks with me and talks with me, right, and tells me I am his own, and, and, and um, um, you know, that, that hymn called In the Garden. And so just, just think about it that way, right? Without, without coming to faith in Christ and putting your faith in you don't have a relationship with God. You are in a position, we are in a position where we're actually um, stuck in sin. You know, think about it like quicksand. Right? And there's no way out except for Jesus throwing you the rope, okay? And that rope is what he did on the cross, but you have to, like, reach out for it, right, and say, I need that. I need your saving grace. Because when you do then, you're transferred to the kingdom of his beloved son, out from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. And this man who... Um, was demon-possessed, uh, isn't it interesting, as you think about it, as you read through that, you learn a little bit of, of, uh, of demonology, if you will, right? You learn a little bit about the demon world, is that the demons know who Jesus is. Uh, did, did you hear what he said to him there um, in verse 28 of Luke 8? It says, when he saw Jesus, he cried and out and fell down before him and said with a loud voice, what do you have to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? So the demons knew who Jesus is, right? And in fact, when you read a parallel passage in one of the other Gospels, right? So there's four Gospels, right? And there are some passages that are parallel in each one, some of the same stories, but from a different eyewitness account. One of the other accounts mentions the fact that basically the, the demons were like, you know, don't send us into the abyss, uh, and the implication is, in the way the wording, I didn't, I didn't put the verse down here, but the implication is that, like you're going to do later. Like they know it's coming. The demons know they will have an end, okay, and be thrown into hell. And so, um, but, but these demons knew who Jesus was, and they're saying, what are you going to do with us? And, and, you know, just with the word, Jesus... Uh, you know, sends these um, demons, and there was more than one, 
Um, they asked to be, uh, you know, well, let's just take a quick look back there. It says, they begged him not to command them to depart into the abyss, verse 31. And then it mentions that there was a large herd of pigs. And by the way, they're in a, um, an area that's uh, mostly Gentile. So, because you might think, well, what are the Jews doing with a bunch of pigs, you know, here, right? Uh, that's not kosher, right? But, but it's in a primarily a Gentile area, so they wouldn't have cared about any food laws or anything. And so, there's a large herd of pigs feeding on the hillside. They begged him to let them enter those pigs, so he gave them permission. And so, that gives you the idea that the demonic world is on a leash, okay? They're on a leash. They only do what they're permitted to do, okay? Now, that is an interesting concept. I mean, it is true, and we try to figure out, well, how does that work? You know, how does God use the demons to do His will, you know? Um, and that's a great question, um, but make no mistake, it's not, like, it's not like God and the demons are like on equal footing. It's not like yin and yang, bad and good. No, it's, it's God is ruling over all, okay? And for a time, the demons are existing and allowing to do some things, but they are permitted to do it, okay? They are permitted, and there's somehow... God is working and using those things for His ultimate will. And so, so I'm just pointing out that as you read through this, you learn a little bit about the, the demonic world. But, but you know what's interesting? There's as much said about the townspeople in this passage as there is about the demonic, the demoniac. There's probably more words said about and commented on about how the people reacted to what happened, then this man's changed life. And I'm telling you, those, there were some of those people who were just as duped by Satan and in the domain of darkness as the demoniac. It's just they weren't possessed. You know what I'm saying? Like when somebody reads this, they may say, well, at least I'm not demon-possessed. Well, but you're still in spiritual darkness if you don't know Christ as Savior, right? And, and those people were just as stuck in their sin as the demoniac. I mean, what did they say to Jesus? Get out of town. That's what they said. You know, we're afraid. Get out of town, please. Leave. They, and Jesus just delivered this guy. This guy hasn't been in his right mind for years. And we see the transformation in the man's life. He's clothed. He's in his right mind at the end of the passage, right? And so, but, but what they tell him, right, right, in verse 37, um, then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked him to depart from them, for they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and returned. Part of me wonders if it was the pig farmers who were saying, it's time to get this guy out of town. He's, the economics of this situation of him staying here is a problem, right? I mean, it kind of makes sense from like a human standpoint, right? A, a, we just lost a bunch of pigs drowned into the lake because he sent the demons into the pigs and they ran into the water. And so it kind of reminds you of when Paul encountered um, some unbelievers who uh, worshipped idols, and people were burning their witchcraft books. They were, their lives were changing. They were following Jesus. And, you know, all the people that made the little idols that the people used to worship, they're not selling many anymore. So they want to run Paul out of town, right? And see, not everybody loves Jesus. That's true. Because he is going to change things up. He transforms lives, and that means sometimes things are going to change, right? Things are going to change. And so uh, it's, just a, it's just important for us to see that, that that life change was not only needed by the demoniac, the guy with these many demons in him, but that life change was needed by these townspeople. Everybody needs Jesus. Everybody needs the life-changing power of Jesus. And it's really there, again, it's there for us 
For anyone who will call upon the name of the Lord, it says, will be saved. Anyone. Anyone. It doesn't matter what you've done. And that's the wonderful thing about the grace of God. Right? It's available to anyone who will call upon the name of the Lord. Right? And, 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 and come to him in, rec- in recognition that in their heart, they're really in rebellion to God. Now, the second thing I just want to mention, the last thing, is just that, you know, Jesus commands those who have experienced his transforming power to tell others. He commands those who have experienced his transforming power to tell others about him. And so, and that's exactly what happens here, right? As you, as you look at the passage, the last two verses, um, this should say actually uh, chapter 8, verses 38 and 39. Um, it, and here are those verses. It says, the man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with him, but Jesus sent him away. So isn't that kind of cool? Here's this guy who, who um, now is just totally changed, transformed, and he, he just wants to hang out with Jesus. He just wants to be with him. He just wants to be with him. Just amazing. And so, but Jesus is saying, no, return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. Okay, now, I don't know if you got this now, but listen to, that, listen to the last verse here, verse 39. Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. Then look what the next sentence says. And he went away proclaiming throughout the whole city how much Jesus had done for him. Jesus is God. I mean, it's just, it's just, a, it's just kind of a quick read. You go right over there, okay, oh, yeah. I mean, I mean, we've seen this. We know this. We've been teaching this, right, uh, that God is one God in three persons, right, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and, and Jesus uh, displaying attributes of deity and humanity all in the same person. We don't know how it works, but we see it coming out of the Bible, right? And so, so this is... Jesus commissioned this man. I mean, you could say this is the first missionary to the Gentiles. This guy who had demons in him, been kept me before Paul ever got there. Okay? Uh, this guy telling people about what Jesus had done for him. Now, um, I think that it's important that we display life transformation, right? That we, there, there's actually fruit in our lives that bears the fact out that we know Jesus is Savior. Because um, a lot of people make a confession, like they'll, they'll make a profession of faith, but maybe it's not an authentic thing. And it, as you look, as we even saw the parable of the sower early on in the book of Luke, right, sometimes it springs up, like, and, and it has a joyous reception of the gospel message, and then it fizzles out. And the reality is it's not about you can't lose your salvation. It just means they never had it. And so, so it, it is important. We, we see this man, has, uh, his life has changed. He's clothed now. He's in his right mind now. He wants to be with Jesus. It even says he sat at his feet. You could possibly imply from that that Jesus was teaching him. He was sitting at his feet, as so many other people did, some of the women did, and the men, just sitting at his feet, right, when he would be in their homes. He would be teaching them. So... Um, I think it's important that we realize that, you know, there is evidence in our lives uh, about whether we, the Holy Spirit is there and we, we have an authentic relationship with God. Um, 1 John chapter 3, verse 6 says, No one who abides in Him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen Him or know, known Him. Now, a lot, this, this brings up a lot of questions. Does that mean like, Pastor Gray, does that mean like when I become a Christian, if I'm truly a Christian, that I'll never sin again? No. No, hang in there a second, though. 1 John 5, 18, same book of the Bible, says, We know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin. The one who was born of God keeps them safe, and the evil one cannot harm them. So John is not, John the Apostle in this letter is not saying that true believers don't sin anymore or have struggles with sin, or fall into sin. Um, He's not talking about some kind of sinless perfection. 
Very simply, he means that believers will not continue practicing sin as a way of life. Okay? There will be a difference between the old way of life without Christ and the new life in Christ. The thief who was characterized by his theft is a thief no more. He has, in other words, it's not as a lifestyle. He might even trip up and steal something and then repent, right, because he realized, ah, I stumbled, you know. But as a way of life, our sin is not a way of life for believers. When we're caught in sin uh, and we, we receive conviction, and uh, by God's grace, we repent of that, right? But it's not a habit of us to steal or to commit adultery, any of these other things, right? So, uh, in fact, um, one of the things I read says, the child of God who was a former thief may struggle with covetousness because that's really at the heart of stealing something is you want it. You want something that someone else has that you don't have, right? So you may still struggle internally with that, right? But no longer lives according to the pattern of stealing. I think the idea here is that, you know, someone who has put their faith in Christ is going to have, over time, right, you're on this trajectory of becoming more Christ-like. You're going to have ups and downs. You know, I, uh, myself, I know I got, I got caught in some sin when I was, soon after I became a believer, and, uh, and, and God pulled me out of that by His grace and the help of some other brothers years ago in, in, a, in a church I was in. And so I'm, I'm not saying that believers can't get caught in sin, but 1 John's telling us that they're not eventually going to stay there. They're not going to continue in it. Okay? And so uh, the reason I'm bringing that up is that this, you know, God wants us to um, be a witness through how we live and, uh, and, how, and how people seeing the transformation. Right? And, and, and I remember, you know, when I first became a Christian, a lot of things changed, and I didn't change them so that people would notice. I changed them because I knew, by God's grace, and it, I, I knew that they needed to change, okay? I knew they needed to change to honor God and to live according to His will. And people see that. They see that. But we can't stop at just, like, putting things on display. We need to also proclaim it. We need to actually tell people how they can be made right with God, okay? And that's important, that, and that's what this man does. Let me tell you what Jesus has done for me, right? And then tell you how you can know him. I, I think it's fine to tell your story uh, about how God has, has uh, worked in your life and brought you to the point of faith. It's wonderful to tell that. But then you need to tell them how they can know God. You need to tell them how they can be forgiven, how they can experience the life-transforming power of Jesus Christ by faith. And so, um, it's, it, you, know, you know, if you know the basics of the gospel message, that's all you need to know. I mean, if you know how to have a relationship with God, you can certainly at least tell somebody that. Now, it's scary, isn't it? It's scary to tell people um, spiritual, com talk, have spiritual conversations at all just because a lot of people just get all, well, you know, they, they, you know, people always say, well, there's two things you don't always talk about, right? You don't talk about religion, you don't talk about politics, right? But uh, as a believer, you can't not talk about religion, okay? If by religion we mean how they have a relationship with Jesus Christ, okay? A religion might mean a lot of other things to a lot of other people, but we're talking about we want people to know how to have a relationship with Jesus. It's the most important thing. The, the most important thing. And so, but just know that the Lord calls every believer to do this. Um, he calls everyone to do this. He's, in Mark 16, 15, he says, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Everybody needs to know because everybody is either in the domain of darkness or in the kingdom of his beloved son. Amen. Acts 4.12 says, and there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. What name is that? Jesus, right? There's no other way. There's no other path. No matter what anybody tells you, 
All paths don't lead to God. If that path is not Jesus alone, it's not the path. Okay? But this is why it's so important. This is why it's so critical. Uh, people's souls, the eternal, eternal destiny of their souls, depends upon them knowing. Right? May God give us the grace and the boldness that we need to simply tell our story uh, about what Jesus has done for us and then let people know how they can know him too. Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for uh, this passage that shows that there can there is freedom from sin, there is freedom from addiction, there's freedom from uh, all kinds of things that shackle us. Uh, we don't have to be demon-possessed uh, to know that sin enslaves, and it is enslaving. And so, Lord, we just pray... Um, Lord, if anyone here is, is caught in sin, Lord, we pray that you would give them freedom. Pray that they would find that freedom in Christ. That they would reach out to Jesus and say, Lord, free me, save me, forgive me. And Lord, um, help us, Lord, for, for those of us that have been believers a while, help us to not take for granted that he has, Jesus has transferred us from the kingdom of from the domain of darkness to the kingdom of his beloved son. And to, to, to think on that, to praise you for that. And also to think about how you've transformed our lives, how you've changed us, how you've changed us over the years or over the months. Lord, we want to give you praise now as we sing together, Lord. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. All right, thank you, Greg. All right, let's stand up and let's sing to him. It's a miracle work.
don't feel that you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't say that you're working, and even when I don't feel that you're working, you never stop, you never stop working. Never stop, never stop working. We make a miracle work. I promise, keep light in the darkness. My God, that is how you are. You are. We make a miracle work. I promise, keep light in the darkness. My God, that is how you are. Deliverer, the miracle worker, amen. Psalm 62 says, God has spoken plainly, and I have heard it many times. Power, O God, belongs to you. Unfailing love, O Lord, is yours. Amen. Let's praise our God for his power and his unfailing love right now.
Praise Him.